thank you everyone for being here, especially on Valentine's Day. And um, I promise to make this um, as uh, thrilling and, uh, and exciting to set the tone for the evening. So um, I'll start a little bit um, about why we're even talking about this. Um, internet has really fundamentally redefined how we th see things um, and how the evolution of everything from mass media to um, our day-to-day -day existence has been influenced by that. And art is no exception. Um, I will discuss sort of three phases of that. One is through my personal career. Um, secondly, through the art market. And finally, through uh, an example of some artists that I think really exemplify that. And I start with Raised on the Internet, since I myself um, consider myself part of the generation that really grew up with that as um, a medium that we had um, for, since birth. Um, I grew up in Russia, St. Petersburg, um, amongst the halls of Matisse's and Picasso's. And really, that was largely influential to my love of art. Um, I moved to Canada and uh, there, as mentioned, I studied art and economics and uh, came to New York about 10 years ago at this point, much like Cindy Sherman in this untitled film still. In New York I realized that it was a critical moment when all of a sudden being the youngest person at a gallery meant that you got the job of doing social media. Um, and that was an interesting moment because suddenly the skill set that I had naturally could translate into something valuable. Um, in 2012, I joined Artsy when it was still in beta. Do you guys know what Artsy is? It's a contemporary marketplace for um, art online which amalgamates um, thousands of artists and uh, many, many galleries and museums in, in, in one spot. Um, with Artsy, I traveled to over 35 different art fairs. Um, I brought art collectors onto the platform and really started to think about how we can sell art online and how we can sort of redefine the traditional sort of tropes of the structures that exist within the art world. I think that many people were still very skeptical when this began, I will admit that back in the day, it was a challenge to even get galleries to give us images. Everyone was quite terrified that we were going to make copies of the artworks or release the images to some unauthorized use cases. And, you know, it was all sort of everything was new. Clearly, um, six years later, um, you know, joining the Zwerner team as a new position that just could not have existed before, I think we all have seen that shift. And um, as I worked at Artsy and did more and more online engagement, I realized that art was still very tangible. And no matter what you did, you still needed to connect it to, um, to a physical entity. And within Artsy, I um, founded something that was called Artsy Projects, which is an artist project um, platform to commission various different happenings, performances around the world. Um, through that, we're able to see how one can reach a much bigger audience online while um, still serving sort of the core community in person. And this was um, one of the early iterations called Collective Reality that was um, supported by Gucci and SoundCloud at, during Art Basel Miami. Um, it was an immersive dome where um, you can see a little, little bit of from this photo where you can really look in any direction and see the artworks. And we worked with three leading VR artists um, of the day and really brought VR beyond the headset. So it took the entire experience of virtual reality and mapped it out into this large dome. The interesting factor here is we had 700 guests attend that evening. But through the videos and the 360 uh, they were able to put online, we had over 300,000 people watch this online and over 2 million people experience some section of it through social media. And there is where the scale kind of gets interesting. Another project that I worked on a few years ago um, was Concrete Storm. Microsoft approached um, me with an unreleased um, augmented reality device called the HoloLens. 
Um, I think it's in right now in some modes and you can start to look at it already but um, basically they were trying to figure out how this can have applications within um, worlds um, you know beyond just gaming and uh, what they had thought of and the project that I worked on there was um, bringing physical reality as well as digital reality into one fold and that's very much at the core of the things that I think have set my career trajectory is really um, combining both. Here, um, the columns were actually digitally inserted into this sort of space. What was great about this project was even though it was commissioned for Microsoft, it ended up at the Stedelijk Museum, um, the, one of the most renowned museums in Amsterdam a year later. And so very infrequently do you see brand projects that can end up within museums. Um, often these sort of projects and iterations would take form um, with obviously uh, partners. This was something we did with Dior and Bergdorf Goodman and um, really have this full public engagement. Um, really un starting to understand how the audience that was looking at the art was also experiencing it through the social channels. And then we come to David Zerner, where I started um, this summer, actually, um, or, or rather early fall. Um, I was hired as the first uh, director of online sales. Um, this position did not exist at the gallery, nor other galleries. And I think this really sort of sets the tone for what is to come both within the sort of art sphere, um, as galleries are paying more attention um, to the online space, and what art production is also, and how it's evolving. Um, the things that I'm responsible for at the gallery include the strategy and curation, as Michelle mentioned, um, of our programs, which include the viewing room, um, art fair, the postings that we put online, as well as available artworks and third uh, party marketplaces. So now that you know a little bit about where sort of my history and my experience came from, um, I want to talk about collecting art and really the sort of path forward that I see and um, at least one um, proposal for that. <laughs> Technology has been transformative um, in terms of how we really um, engage day to day and obviously the internet is the most um, omnipresent mass medium of our time. Um, it, it's really radically changed and upended industries such as music, fashion, and transportation. Um, but within the art world, that has been a bit of a lag. And of course, um, many, many of you probably know um, why that has been, because art objects are individual. And so, you know, while with a luxury handbag, you can very easily apply an online retail model, um, art, there's much more finessing to do. However, that said, um, we've been figuring out the art world one step at a time. And uh, let me offer a little bit of insight into the industry. Um, the Art Basel annual report, which is sort of the, one of the industry leading reports, suggests that the online art market is about 5.4 billion um, of all the art and antiques sold per year. Um, that has been growing, and in the last year it grew about um, 8%. It, it accounts um, for still less than 10% of the total sales of the art world, but the pace at which it's growing is quite impressive. So it's 10% um, year to year growth from 2016, and more interesting than that, it's actually 72% over five years. And so you can see that amongst the different sectors of private sales, auction, online has really been contributing to all those streams. There are many players in the online art space. So anyone still looking for a Valentine's present? Um, there's a Sotheby's jewelry auction happening. Um, ve very conveniently ending today. Um, and of course, online allows that um, instant buying ability. Um, Sotheby's um, last year sold 50 million in online only, um, and actually 200 million in um, online through the regular auctions, meaning that when the lots were actually still physically in the auction house and then someone could bid online, much like they do in, on the telephone. 
Christie's, um, which just released their numbers for 2018, had 88 online only um, auctions, and then they had $87 million in total for last year, which represents a 20% growth, which is very significant. But it's not only the auction houses that are jumping on board. Um, there's a lot of galleries who are starting to take note. Um, some of you might know Pace Gallery. It's a major um, gallery with many locations, including uh, New York and Hong Kong. Um, they began a program called Future Pace a few years ago, which is really their gallery without walls. And it focuses on technology. And this is one of the interesting ways how um, galleries have started to approach the online space. They pursue public commissions and urban projects. And even though you guys don't know it, many of you might have seen some of those, such as the Thames River Bridge uh, that Leo Villarreal um, and the San Francisco Bridge, of course. And so um, thinking about a different model that the gallery and artist could pursue is very much part of this dialogue of digital um, art and how art and technology are really moving forward. Um, what's curious is um, Pace, um, the head of Pace, Mark Grimisher, has suggested a model of, of alternative um, sort of art buying, wherein for public projects like um, this, which is a team lab uh, art installation, where really very few collectors will want to go in and actually acquire a piece of immersive art, they, the gallery charged admission, which is very it's kind of very novel to the industry. They um, did this in Palo Alto um, a couple years ago, and it was $20 admission to come see the piece because, of course, nothing sold, and it's a huge engineering um, effort and feat. Um, but really thinking about new ways of commissioning artists and paying and supporting artists has been fundamental in this shift. Um, we come to um, my gallery, David's Werner. Uh, this is a Kusama show we had uh, not too long ago. And really, um, again, um, a gallery that has been at the forefront of the space long before even I joined. Um, so that's been exciting for me to come in. Um, David's Werner has five locations and represents artists such as um, Kusama, Carrie James Marshall, Lisa Yuskovich, and Donald Judd. We approach online art sales with the same philosophy that we approach and evaluate every other initiative, which is through the lens of whether it is great from our artists. And so by thinking about what is the best for artists and estates, we realize that in five to 10 years, really, this is an evolving marketplace and we need to be representing them and meeting our collectors um, on all the different channels that they interact. We approach the idea of the online sales in a format that is um, an extension of the gallery. It is, very, um, it is very much in the sort of nature to think about it as a six exhibition space as we refer to it. And um, it gives me a lot of uh, fun to program and think about what we're gonna put in this space. One of the, one of the first projects that I did while, uh, when I joined the gallery was um, Lisa Yuskovich an online viewing room. And I hear she was gonna be prominently featured here this summer. <laughs> um, it, it's, it was a neat experience because it really got to work with an artist and present a body of work in, and unique sort of narrative that maybe um, someone buying a piece of hers wouldn't necessarily have uh, by presenting it within the context um, of the artist. We presented prints and unique pieces. So, you know, I think one of the things that people think about online is just for prints and editions and um, having, again, the experience, I can tell you that um, there's not a single medium that is good for online. There really is a full range and spectrum, and as long as you put things that are exciting to collectors, I think the collectors are there for that. Um, what's radical about online is because, um, because of the medium, there's sort of more transparency. And so what, when I was describing that when I worked at Artsy and six years ago I was begging a gallery to give me an image and people were skeptical, right now some of the biggest galleries are actually putting pricing publicly available online, which is really um, a shift in the mentality. It's embracing transparency. So this exhibition platform exists as a URL. And wh while we do sometimes stage it with pop-ups and um, you know, physical iterations, really it is meant to be um, something that lives wholly online. 
Um, the amazing thing about that is that it means that collectors from anywhere in the world can come and access it. So instead of opening up a space, let's say in Rome and Switzerland or you know, Geneva or somewhere else, um, all of a sudden the gallery can have the online location and service much broader community. This is my most recent project, um, which is Raymond Pettibon. He, um, he actually worked with us to put together um, a collection of works that have never been seen before and coming from him. And again, I think that's where I've really found the strength of treating this as an exhibition platform instead of just trying to mirror what the gallery has. And so um, we find that it's much less exciting that if you go and you see something in the gallery and then you put it online, then it's just you know a direct parallel versus here releasing a body of work from 1980s, which is not seen before, um, only online actually brings collectors and makes them feel like it's something that's very, um, very fresh and very new and that they should be checking frequently. With that, um, I'll kind of shift to the, you know, from the art market to the bigger perception. Um, and, and with that, you know, really sort of having shown you that the market is definitely adapting, I want to show you how artists are really handling this because I think in some ways that is the most interesting factor. We all sort of are um, obviously here to serve the artists and um, the work that they produce and um, because of that, obviously, they've been evolving. Um, when you think of digital or um, internet art, we often envision something like this. <laughs> Glitchy Photoshop net art files. Um, but you know, I think that there is plenty of interesting discourse around this kind of work, but that is not what my focus is, um, you know, either the gallery or today in discussing this with you, because really what I feel strongly about is that um, while this is a stream of art that lives online um, or has evolved from the online space, um, all art being made today is really influenced by digital currents. And so there's really no um, segmenting just digital art or um, just net art. This is Joseph Albers. Many of you might know him as something of a more um, historical reference. He was a key voice at um, Bauhaus in Germany, started in 1919, and would go to teach a generation of American artists at Black Mountain College. I mean, he was someone who you know, worked along Kandinsky um, early on, and so um, that comparison of why I'm bringing him up might surprise some of you. However, um, he is in some ways foundational to how we look at um, art that is inspired by, um, by digital technology because it's very much what he does um, with this series, which is called the homage to the square, is he produces an extensive body of variations on one single theme. They're always square, there's color modulations, there's sort of the format is consistent. Um, but within that, he is able to experiment and try all the variable permutations. So he constructs this kind of code and within that he plays that out. And that is an early, early precursor to what sort of some of the um, artists today are doing and that is very much art based on concept and information as much as is based on formal qualities. I will say that this piece was made in 69. So it seems quite historic, but I'll also remind you that at the same time, um, you know, the things we think of as very contemporary um, were happening. And the first internet protocol suite was founded in 1970, with, which provided the end-to-end -end data communication. Um, this was um, a piece that um, I curated, but it's from 1970, and you might have seen it because it's this piece has been a dia in Beacon and many other um, exhibitions. Um, it's by Lawrence Wiener, who is a conceptual artist, and I think um, in, in some ways, you know, this is um, this is code. This is um, th this is basically the artist creating an instruction of what the artwork can and should be, and with that, he by defining that, he allows us to have a set of rules that we can follow the same year as this artwork was created, um, 
1970 was also when the first email was sent. So just putting in parallel that while we think of Lawrence Wiener and conceptual art is quite you know, historic, it's actually quite parallel to the information technology and the developments within that. Um, the in information show that happened at the MoMA in 1970 really set the course for um, conceptual art to be evolving into art of sort of um, the digital information era. Um, and one of the quotes that I want to read you from the press release of the MoMA show um, is, is this. Many of the highly intellectual and serious young artists represented here have addressed themselves with the question of how to create art that reaches to a larger audience than that interested in contemporary art, which has led them to communicate in the information. And so with that, it's something that I feel I could see currently um, any artist describing, but to think that that was um, 50 years ago is uh, quite radical. Some of you might recognize this um, early net artist um, and would be excited to learn that Andy Warhol, um, who passed quite early in um, 87, in the last couple years of his life started to extensively experiment with creating um, art with computers. So he really was, again, someone who um, you know, was not necessarily um, a net artist, but was an artist who used all media of dissemination. And of course, at the time, um, when the personal computer came into play, he, um, he, he wouldn't be left behind. I, I think that this, this piece made by the Arte Povera artist, um, Maurizio Nenucci, um, is very relevant. And hopefully the last few slides have sort of stressed the point of all art has been contemporary, that even um, at every point of time, art has been sort of a reflection and direct absorption of what are all the elements around it. Um, and with that, any art that's made in the current era is such that even if the artist is a painter, inevitably the images that they source are very much based on sort of a new aesthetic. There's no neat way to categorize things, and that's why um, I kind of, you know, talking about this hybrid idea would really propose the sort of notion and have talked about the idea of cyborg art. Um, this is an artist that um, is with our gallery, Jordan Wolfson. He's the youngest artist there, um, and he both he works in both organic and digital tropes. And this idea of a cyborg, which traditionally we kind of think of this um, an element applied to a larger notion of an artwork that's both digital and analog, that's both online and off, is how I see um, 21st century art. It's a hybrid of ideas and inputs. I, I love this quote. Um, We're already a cyborg. You have the digital version of yourself in the form of email, social media, and all things that you do um, by Tesla founder and futurist um, Elon Musk. And it's very much a reminder that, you know, the decades ago we would have thought that, that this is the crazy future and so um, right now we're sort of live it very naturally without actually realizing that and I think art is very much the same. To illustrate my point I've um, I want to show you a few examples a few artists who really have this hybrid um, cyborg art element and as mentioned I won't stress the artists that are creating websites or really just in the very um, digital based media because I think it's actually more relevant to show you how um, artists who are um, the ones that we know and might you know have the large museum shows and Venice Biennale pavilions are actually very much within the fabric of the digital landscape. The first artist um, is Anne Imhoff. I don't know if any of you guys know her or went to the Venice Biennale two years ago. Um, she is a German artist who represented Germany um, at the Venice Biennale in 2017, which is the Olympics of the art world. She actually went on to receive the Golden Lion Award, which means that she won the best, like the gold medal. <laughs> this piece was titled Faust. Um, the curator explained it as an examination that constitutes the now, the contemporary reality, the how we are confronted with far-reaching effects of technological change. Yet within this pavilion, there was not an LED or a digital element, camera, nothing in sight. In fact, 
this was an architectural intervention. It was a performance piece with bodies moving all around. The, the piece was described by one critic, which I thought was great, as a catwalk from hell, as powerful as it is uneasy. Given the recent zombie show here, I think it might resonate as well that the, the figures seem to be there and not. The piece speaks of power, um, who holds it, who seeks it, how to reclaim it. It deals with the idea of sort of inclusion and exclusion of bodies um, and what's left out and how sort of, you know, society shifts have changed that, um, both on a micro level and macro level of social groups. And of course, the artist is addressing this in a time when Europe was sort of undergoing a lot of, um, a lot of crisis and, you know, issues of um, migrants and how to assimilate new populations within, within that. There was these Dobermans that were outside creating a very much uneasy, anxious atmosphere. And I think that's where we come to this idea of how do you, this artist is creating a digital anxiety through analog means. By having these dogs, chain fences, uneasy bodies, all of these things that are basically an outward manifestation of something that she and sort of her generation are feeling. I think the other interesting point of how this is a digital piece is that um, the floor that everyone stood on and the performers performed on um, was in multiple layers and was glass. And the performers didn't have a stage. They were all around you. And the artist really wanted to create this multi-perspective point of view because, as she said, no longer is the experience just a stage and the you know, viewer because right now how we immerse ourselves and how we look at things on our phones, how we're used to the digital edits and all the crops, everything is multi-perspective. When we look at a video, we see it from all various angles. And so through that, she's recreating that in a live version, basically. A year before that, Venice Pavilion, she did um, a beautiful piece called Angst at Kunsthal Basel. Um, which is an important European art museum. Um, it was a three-part opera composed by the artist and constructed with contemporary uh, choreography and cryptic gestures. Again, sort of this, this could almost be an ad for American Apparel or something, but it's just you don't know what you're being sold. And the artist really sort of loves that notion and that strange, strange um, tension that kind of it begins to evoke when you feel um, something that's kind of this consumerist nature almost crawling through it. There was a piece that she actually did create uh, at Hamburger Bahnhof in Berlin that did include drones and performers. So it, it's, and in other instances, she has utilized technology. And here was this beautiful dance where she actually said bodies and again, drones together. And, this is very much, again, the embodiment of the cyborg, the two, um, you know, working together, mechanic um, and analog. The next artist um, I want to talk about is um, one that was um, at Munster Sculpture Project in Germany, which um, some of the, the group may, may have seen. Uh, it actually was the first time that I think I met Heidi. Uh, so um, this piece of Pierre Wieg, where he took over a abandoned skating ring and he created a post-human ecosystem. Um, that sounds like a lot of uh, art talk maybe, um, but really, uh, I guess, well, let me sort of try to, uh, tr try to show you how something that looks like it's, um, you know, c could be ruins or uh, apocalyptic um, fragments is actually very much in sort of in dialogue with the digital um, and the now. Uh, he had, th this piece was an archaic attempt to mimic life, as he called it. Um, the building is a haunted living organism, an enclosed place, a porous to the outside. The musical score and pattern on the roof are from um, a seashell um, of a venomous sea snail. <laughs> the snail um, is also found in the glass tanks that he inserted all around the installation. So what does it have to do with digital? Actually, a lot. 
because along with these creatures in this abandoned skating ring, he inserted sensors that monitored the creatures and all of the levels, such as the CO2, the bacteria levels, um, the oxygen within the ice ring, and then had an algorithm that calculated the vitality or livability of this space. He also created um, an application that when you looked at it, the roof would appear to open and there would be these um, beautiful, slow sort of um, elements that sort of escaped. And again, this is an artist who uses very traditional means, but as well as um, something like augmented reality to create sort of a parallel universe. This piece, um, this piece is really about sort of thinking about what what constitutes life, what constitutes an ecosystem. Um, it's kind of creating this digital horizon um, for us and you know, potentially envisioning a future where the world isn't inhabited by humans. The work is both a reference to land art, um, like Walter de Maria, and, you know, but as well um, a possible sort of scenario where it could be a colony on Mars. And it's interesting because it really is this kind of interplay of the two. More recently, um, he, the same artist, Pierre Wieg, um, created a show called Umwelt, <laughs> that's a mouthful, um, at the Serpentine Gallery in London. And that is one of the most prestigious spaces. Um, these images are part of the show. Um, they, they seem at first sort of odd and in some ways human and in some ways not. There's something glitchy about them. Um, and, and what they are actually is the brain scans um, or MRI scans of thoughts. So he worked with a cutting edge um, scientist from Japan actually and he basically translate, translated thoughts into images in the most um, direct cutting edge way that we know how. Um, so th these images are actually generated from people's unconsciousness. If you think about art history, the surrealists and uh, you know, Salvador Dali would have loved this. This is what they were all after, is trying to get at this notion of how to translate the subconscious out. Um, and here, using science, he is doing very much that. This is a small clip. And it's, sort of, it's both frightening and beautiful at the same time, and you don't know what to think. Um, to me, it's amazing because obviously this is just such a starting point of all of this. I mean, already a lot of science is working with this idea of how to um, you know, understand the brain, and I think we're gonna see a lot of developments with that in the next century. And if you think about how profound um, that's gonna be on terms of art making and our understanding of visual culture, it'll be even more so than the photograph was in representation. Um, when suddenly you can have images that are born out of your mind instead of you having to translate or use the rough tools that are available to us. Another artist um, I wanna draw on is um, Laura Owens. She is um, maybe more traditional in some ways than the other artists I've shown you. She's a painter. She's a painter that um, is having an amazing career moment. Um, she's based out of LA and her lush paintings have been recently gotten her a mid-career retrospective at the Whitney Museum in New York, which is very prestigious for an artist. She is sort of uh, the evolution to the German school of Christopher Wool and Sigmar Polke and Albert Olin and kind of the legacy that exists. Um, but unlike those painters, she was born in 1970. And obviously her canvases have a different frame of reference. She uses Photoshop um, to create um, this kind of sketches and then basically paints them with a trompe l'oeil effect. And so while um, what you see looks like it's really impasto and thick, it's actually meant to trick your eye in that. So again, going back to a technique that was sort of you know, used in the Renaissance era um, to actually create something very contemporary and a visual um, narrative that really is only familiar to us in the last few decades. While her work looks quite different from the last two artists I've shown you, I think again, it's very much this hybrid model of continuing the tradition of abstraction while working with virtual and um, digital reference. Her canvases are imbued with bitmaps and pixels and small sort of threads of things that she pulls off the internet. They're simultaneously glitchy um, 
as if she's sort of the future of the pointillist movement. She samples different cultural sort of tropes, um, everything from greeting cards to her children's scrawls. So you can see, I think there's sort of a snail in the leaf that probably is borrowed from that. This is a show um, she had in a Petzl gallery in Berlin in uh, 2015. And neat how she also places the canvas as a sculptural object. On the flip side, you can see this. And again, they sort of you know, become something that you walk around and experience. Um, again, you can see the sort of effect that she plays with. Now, what I think is really incredible about this is again, that she's sort of in dialogue with art history. She's creating a different way of image making with multiple viewpoints and illusionary space. And when you talk about illusionary space, when, um, again, classical artists painted, for them, you know, when they discovered perspective, for example, that was very much about this core of creating this window into the world or create and mimicking something that was um, real through these tricks of art. And I think this piece um, is really exemplary of that. It's so simple, but I have to say this was probably my favorite piece in the show. Um, through the mere suggestion of some horizontal lines and literally sort of paint, Dab, she suggests a seascape. But what's really much more interesting about than just the seascape is this effect where you see the, the seagull in the shadow. And, and of course, that is painted and that is made to trick our minds into this sort of textural play. Um, it's, it, it's quite simple, but by just creating that shadow and effect that Photoshop has enabled us to kind of perceive much, much clearer, she again sort of wraps this, you know, centuries of art into one sort of neat painting and, you know, a dialogue there. And the last artist that I will mention is Rachel Rawson. Um, she is the artist, when I showed you actually some of the projects I've worked on, that um, she was the artist in the dome with a 360 VR. She was the first virtual reality artist um, to be um, in, at the new museum artist in residence. And um, her works are probably in the most digital scape of all of them. But I think what's interesting is about her is she's an artist that balances, again, both this sort of hybrid space. She was born in 87 in Florida, and um, she actually came to New York and did and programmed websites for a living until her, she could basically make uh, a living as an artist. And um, an interesting thing is she used the male pseudonym because she got paid more, she told me, <laughs> of course. Um, she, um, she will have a really significant show at a private collection called the Zublodovic Collection in London coming up. Uh, and is really an artist to watch that I, I think is, is at the forefront of a lot of these developments. Um, in her breakout work, she took, um, she took elements of different video games. And again, I think it's such an interesting element to sample something that is so, um, so much about mass and popular culture, but she restructured them. So she doesn't actually create um, often these elements, but she takes them and samples them. Uh, she finds them and then reconstructs them into these virtual spaces. So what you're seeing here is something that would exist potentially um, in a virtual reality. Um, what's again really you know beautiful about the work is the interplay with history. And here she's taken something from Call of Duty, and, and maybe some of your kids play that game, um, and she's actually made a landscape out of it that was you know kind of in an impressionistic manner. Um, furthermore, she you know loves this sort of lush green and she starts to actually paint it. And so when she creates some of these beautiful landscapes, um, she then starts to take them into the physical space. So she actually kind of does a reverse instead of translating um, the current world into the digital space, she constructs things in the digital space and then starts to make them in the physical one. And so these sculptures that she makes out of plexi and beautiful paintings are actually, again, elements that she's drawn from the virtual world. Um, you, you can see how strange and stunning that these, um, these works are. Again, there's something kind of surrealist and melting about them. There's something impressionistic or almost um, Joan Mitchell about this one. Um, but also, it's clearly informed by an aesthetic that's really radically new. It's something that people would not have necessarily imagined until we had the tools um, and the sort of language that we do now. She calls this sort of data loss and slippage, and this idea of one reality slipping into the other. 
And I would just end with this small clip to show you what um, is inside of the headset experience and how sort of poetic and fractured that is. Thank you. So I'm just gonna ask a couple of questions and I'd love to hand it over for any questions from the audience. Um, thank you, Elena, so much for that talk. It was really thank you. not like anything that we've ever really <laughs> talked about here at the Elsewhere Art Museum. Um, and one of the things that struck me that is something that we think a lot about here is this concept of dichotomies. It came a lot um, through the artists that you presented and I'm wondering how that relates to the work that you do and kind of projecting what I imagine must be a lot of uh, work that you do to kind of help people who are very used to a certain type of art world or a certain type of experience kind of negotiate um, something that maybe is unfamiliar. And so I'm wondering if that concept of dichotomies is present in your work. I, I think it, as very much you pointed out, it, it, it's central to it, but I can't, I'm a believer in this hybrid model. So for me, there's, um, art should never exist solely online. I think it should always you know, be the kind of combination of the two. And very much what I do, and in sort of the, especially within the gallery scape, I, I'm the director of online sales. My, um, you know, the projects that I do live, um, li live in the internet, they live in this sort of realm of um, you know, pixels and, and you know, kilobytes. But at the same time, what's interesting is I actually have a registrar. I need a photographer because the artwork is physical. And so I still have a traditional sort of what you call team to be able to handle the artworks. But what, um, how we then present it and how we sort of start to uh, create these exhibitions is in the digital space. And, and so I think that's constantly something that I think about and um, clearly very much I think at the core of navigating this is how do you really um, not lose one experience for the other and how, how do you really meld the two together? Mm. It kind of brings me to my next question. Earlier today we were talking about uh, kind of other saying we have around here that we inherited that keep the main thing the main thing. Um, so given that there's so much complexity and you're balancing, you know, market research and technology and all of the artwork information, what is the main thing to you in your work? The artist. <laughs> that, that is without doubt. I think at the end of the day you have to, I think that's been my guiding sort of north star for the, my whole career is um, how, how do you serve artists the best? And so, um, you know, 20 years ago, no one thought that Sears would be out of business or that um, Amazon would you know, be what it is now. I think that basically in, in what I try to do is I try to say, I try to work with each artist that I get the opportunity to, to really create what they want in both an exhibition platform online, but as well how, how do you work with a variety of artists to bring their work and all the sensitivity that it needs um, to the kind of bigger audience. How do you sort of archive it? How do you um, how do you share it? How then do you translate it? And so to me, it's always sort of it's always about the artists and how, how to best serve them in their practice. Great. <laughs> okay, so I'll hand it over now. If anyone else would like to pose a question to Elena. Thank Talk about you know RC as a, as a pioneer in this and, and where you think it's going to go over the next five years and, and, and a lot of the people jumping into the program and, and, and into the digital media and online sales. And we always laughed at Amazon, the traditional retailers, many years ago, but you know Saks is out of business now. Uh, so it's interesting because when I would say six seven years ago. I would say about about six, seven years ago, there's a lot of sort of players in the art market um, trying to get online and still, you know, and so then the field kind of condensed because there's a network effect that inevitably takes place. Uh, because every gallery, every artist doesn't want to upload their works to 20 different platforms. There has to be sort of a centralization that happens. But of course, different platforms serve different needs. 
Um, and, and so Artsy um, you know, has risen to become a, the largest platform for contemporary art. However, of course, you know, it services galleries um, and museums, so it really sort of leaves a space because it doesn't serve artists. Um, I think how, what we're gonna sort of see in the general market evolution of platforms and marketplaces within the next, um, within the next you know, five to 10 years is really um, testing the limits of obviously um, e-commerce and you know, instantaneous buying, um, as well as how to translate the sort of art experience um, and much more narrative and storytelling elements. And so through that, um, you know, I, I showed the example of marketplace models and Christie's and Sotheby's definitely have an immediate sort of buy functionality. Um, Artsy, which is, you know, the leader in the space, um, is just, if you can believe it, about uh, two months ago introduced the buy functionality where you enter a credit card. And, and that's because, you know, there's still so many things about buying an artwork that really are still difficult to translate. So I think we're going to see a lot of uh, a lot of the industry trying to figure out um, everything from, you know, how do you make sure this is the right collector to how do you make sure that the art insurance and shipping of the object. Um, so all of that is sort of part of the dialogue. I think that these marketplace models are considering and that will be challenged by. Did you say uh, something that seventy-seven? Sotheby's, I believe, had $50 million last year. Uh, Christie's had 88 in online only sales. But it was 77 different events that got the 88. 88 different so online sales. It's a lot of small sales, not, not big, not big million exactly. dollars. I think the average artwork sales price is about um, just under 10000 for them. Yeah. The um, yes. Yeah. How, do you, how do you see blockchain being implemented in, uh, in the art world industry? Um, it, it's an interesting question. So there's two, two main sort of routes I see developing right now. Um, one is authentication and provenance. Um, and I guess maybe let's back up. Blockchain is a, does ever kind of, do people have an idea of what it is? A ledger technology basically that enables, um, enables information that is sort of not shared on a, not on a single base, so it's decentralized, so everyone can see sort of the traces of it. Um, but basically, blockchain is going to have two, I think, impacts on the art world. One is going to be this authentication and provenance model, where um, all of a sudden, when an artist produces an artwork, they're going to be able to have the blockchain record of it, so that you're not going to be able to have fake Rothko's come up and someone say like, oh, well, you know, we don't know if he painted it or not because potentially in the future as artists create the work, it's gonna be sort of encoded in this way. Um, the other sort of method that I see blockchain being implemented is fragmented ownership. And the idea that right now, um, you know, if, if you're a younger collector, if you're someone who's just sort of wants to test out the market, you can't currently go ahead and buy a piece of a Warhol. There's just no such structure that exists. I mean, there's some asset funds that try to do that, but um, something um, that could be made very easily is that any collector, not just an institution or a you know asset fund, can say this Warhol is going to be owned by basically going to become like a public entity, and you can buy shares in it, and we'll sell it in 20 years. And so that I think is as well going to be an application of it. What I see as a problem right now is there's a lot of sort of entrance, and again, there needs to be sort of more. Um, there's a lot of ideas, and I think like, there sort of has to be a unifying factor. So, for example, with provenance, until the major auction houses and some of the galleries agree on a single channel, it's, it's going to be tricky. Yeah? Uh, I just see, uh, like, how can they say exclusivity uh, with selling a, a digital image? Uh, I mean, or uh, something like and security as well, or artists trying to up their security and only printing one image, or I don't know where, where that world is going. Well, I, I think when, when the photograph was invented, and this was a while ago, people kind of were, you know, well, you can print as many of them as you want. What is the value of this object? And since then, we've seen, you know, Cindy Sherman has sold for four million, Jeff Wall as well. You know, there, there's, uh, we've sort of overcome the problem through photography by having sort of more traditional things like, um, you know, that the artist commits to making only a certain amount. So you, you know that maybe you're buying a one and an AP exists ever, um, or maybe there's only five of them in existence and there's a certificate from the artist and you trust the gallery and the artist. So that's sort of, I would say, one model. I, I would, if I zoom out and sort of stand back, fundamentally I would say it's actually, I see 
a, a bigger change and a bigger sort of paradigm change in the industry, which is that especially the work that is being created now that is more um, of this kind of online reproducible work such as net art, which is like a website only or something, um, it's going to get valued differently. So it's not going to get valued on scarcity um, and how rare the object is, but rather it's going to get valued potentially on its sort of cultural significance. And so an alternate model could be that a video is not that this is just one exists, but that a video that gets the most views is most valued, and the idea of sort of creating different mind mindsets for that. And of course, you know, the art world right now operates on this idea of rarity and scarcity, and that's kind of been the traditional selling point, where you get a PDF and, you know, okay, there's only three of them left, and we have reserves on two of them, so like, let us know. Um, but as you can tell by something like the online viewing room, that's radically changing, because all of a sudden, when I launch a viewing room, I put all the works and it says available and as they're sold you can see the prices and I'm not trying to sort of, I wouldn't say trick you, but I'm not trying to sort of sell you this on the fact that it's, um, you know, there, there, there's no more in existence. I'm trying to tell you this is an amazing artist who's culturally significant and that's why you should be interested in the work.